All right, welcome to the collective call. Uh, it's Friday the 21st, and I'm going to share the agenda here. All right, can everybody see that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that as a yes. Um, we have 195 active members, up 17 since March. So we're almost at the very round number of 200. Um, are there any new members on the call today that want to take like five seconds to introduce themselves, please? All right, I'm going to call. Hi. Oh, there we go. Hey, yeah, um, I'm, I'm new. I'm, I'm, I go by, this is not a coin online. My name is Quentin Kruger. I'm actually also in D.C., um public policy DAOs, governance um kind of via nfts and, and crypto so that's, that's the short of it yep uh, thank you very much no this was great um we spoke i think two days ago um and it was great yeah. getting to know you so welcome well. to the collective um and who made, who hi, made the introduction to the collective mel ah, terrific yeah Mel had some nice things to say about the collective, which I appreciate it. Um, and welcome, Quentin. All right. Um, a little operational updates. We have we had our first call for COC Asia yesterday. That went great. Um, Crypto Mondays at Republic on Monday. I expect everybody from the New Jersey, New York area to be there. That means you, Marco. Um, Please come hang out. Their offices on Fifth Avenue are beautiful, and that's where we're going to have our Crypto Mondays. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Marco to talk to us about art. Let's go. Thank you very much. Everybody see hey, hey, Marco, just real quick. Sorry, um, uh, but before you start, uh, yeah. I just want to say that the you know that we put the. Um, uh, you know, that this is the first week that we are going to be holding Crypto Mondays NYC at Republic, and we're looking to build a, uh, you know, a, a really strong relationship with them. And so I just put a link to the meetup and, uh, you know, anybody in NYC, definitely you should come. I think it's going to be uh, a killer night. I'm going to do a fireside chat with uh, Ken Jun, who's the uh, co-founder and CEO of Republic and a, and a really super talented guy. So should be a fun night if you're in NYC. Awesome. Yeah, I'll try to be there. So welcome. My name is Marco Santini. I'm an award-winning artist based in New York City. Really grateful to have met Lou uh, at uh, Paris Blockchain Week. have a lot of different things to share about my background before I get into the main project I've been working on, but this is uh, really new for me and really exciting in many different ways. I have found my life's purpose to spread love and positivity through art and education, which has taken me around the world uh, to paint murals and deliver uh, custom paintings for people, including Ringo Starr, The Beatles, Chris Martin, Coldplay, uh, some other major celebrities and interesting activations. Have partnered with some of the biggest brands in the world for different uh, activations, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, but it really all started with my background in linguistic anthropology, which took me to create this One Love logo uh, with the word love in over 80 different languages. I basically created it one night and had a reaction very strangely to anything I'd ever created before. I illegally put it up around the city, uh, wheat paste posters and stickers, and it explodes. Uh, I'm able to paint at weddings, at Fortune 500s, at corporates, uh, you know, in schools. I basically have Turkish next to Armenian. I put Arabic next to Hebrew, which is next to German. I have Turkish, uh, excuse me, I put uh, Russian next to Ukrainian. So it's this idea that despite our differences, you know, we all have this, this word that we can, you know, look to as a vote of confidence for the future. And it really exploded in popularity, uh, ended up getting me to partner with the United Nations on many different activations. Uh, most excitedly, I got to paint at the UN General Assembly in 2019 with a, you know, earpiece in my ear, listening to what people are saying, uh, and then kind of painting their words on this interactive piece doing murals, t-shirt designs, uh, getting some press with them. Uh, my biggest brand partner to date has been Bloomingdale's. I've done over 20 different events with them across the country. Uh, you name it, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, uh, any kind of activation. I was actually the first artist to paint uh, over the wooden boards in Soho during COVID, got a lot of press on that. It was this mural of appreciation for first responders and essential workers. And then my biggest claim to fame before this big project was that <laughs> 
right after George Floyd was murdered, a cop car was actually burned down right in front of my mural. And for three days, this image was on the front page of the New York Times website, basically telling people to follow what was happening live during the protest. There's this crazy you know, blend between the bright colors and positive messaging and love in many languages juxtaposed with the intensity and the fight for justice and freedom that this kind of iconic image really symbolized. Um, but it really took me into this kind of strange time during COVID. Uh, I was very lucky to paint for Ringo Starr, among many uh, celebrities. I paint schools all around the world. Uh, I like to think of myself as a mirror where I go into the schools and I ask the children what's important to them, what inspires them. And then I take those words, uh, I, I do like a paint by numbers background, and I let the kids uh, actually use spray paint. We do the mural as a collaboration together. And then I put their words into the mural and make them feel really seen and heard, which has been incredibly uh, uplifting in different places around. And then my biggest kind of uh, aspect has been these geometric design murals, which I paint all over, uh, fun, colorful, bright, and just really bold. I, I tell you all this kind of information uh, to bring you to the, to the current. So during COVID, a lot of my live painting activation stuff is kind of dying down. And so I turned to NFTs and things went pretty well. I looked at NFTs from the beginning in 2021 as an add-on to physical pieces. So after up to a certain limit, if someone's buying uh, a physical piece, I would try to bring them into the, the NFT world. I helped them set up their wallets. I helped them get into you know, the Web3 language and then basically did each of these individual pieces. And they were going up and up and up. And it was kind of this crazy, beautiful moment to see you know, where art could take me. And then last year, I get a call from the Museum of Mod uh, Art and Photography in Bangalore, India, that not only hires me to create this interactive mural over 150 feet with uh, words uh, about what art means to them by the, the community, the people who work at the museum online, but then the museum actually acquires one of my artworks, which was amazing. Basically, M.F. Hussein was the Indian Picasso. And I had this idea where I took a book that was signed by him that was just collecting dust, not being appreciated. And I turned it into a work of art. And I didn't necessarily collage it too much. I really try to keep everything exactly where it was in the place, you know, maybe folding it or moving it, but I keep it exactly where it was. So it's not necessarily collage. It's this new art category that Marcus Fox of Christie's says. I'm calling it Illuminism, the idea of shining a light on something or someone to bring a, a new awareness. I feel that we are all more than our superficial covers. We are all the pages and layers within. And I'm trying to bring that to the foreground of a, a new art category. I also got some love from uh, Keith Miller, who's been a mentor and a lawyer to people for a while, who really uh, has believed in this series. So what am I doing? I am taking past, present, and future, trying to bring them together. I take these iconic artist books that are signed by the artists. I read through them. I understand the essence of the work, and then I create artworks from these pieces that's somewhat con uh, you know, controversial in the sense that they're very, very valuable, very, very rare. I was lucky enough to do a big job right before COVID that, that got me uh, the finances to kind of invest in myself to work on this. Uh, and then I collected these books from really high-end museums, high-end book collectors all around the world. And then I create an NFT that's really, to me, a certificate of authenticity, it really serves as a provenance of who owns it. And my belief is that I can take and help take high-end artworks onto the blockchain so that you will know exactly who has pieces at what time to show the legitimacy and to show past ownership, by, which I find as a really valuable asset. So for example, here's a book, uh, just the front cover of a book that I uh, acquired that was signed by Liechtenstein. Here's the artwork that I create with it. I take every single page, keeping it exactly what it was like. He signs it on that first page, you can see that little white strip cut out. I'm not cutting that out and moving it around. I'm keeping it exactly where it was when he touched it and bringing to life all the different aspects of his works. And then what I do is I create this animated NFT where I kind of highlight the signature and I try to imagine what the artist would be doing if they were alive today. Very new, very exciting, but also very controversial. As I said, very, very rare, valuable book that would otherwise be in a, in a very high-end collection. You can see that it's also popping out. So it's not just a flat piece, it pops out. So there's an aspect of pop art meets, uh, meets painting, meets sculpture. It's kind of all in one. Showing you one more here by Basquiat, which is the uh, rarest piece in the collection. This book cost uh, in the five figures just to acquire. Um, you can see there on the bottom left, his name, his signature, his photo. And then I take all his images and I'm basically, I'm calling it a cross-generational collaboration. I'm taking his works and making a new work with them. And he actually you know, signed and touched the book, which I find 
to be really important in terms of the essence of kind of this collaborative effort here. So what happens, I partner with Makerplace, who have a few people on the call, they've been amazing. They get me to scope uh, last year. And on the first day, within an hour, VIP day, the first piece sells, a free to college piece sells for 35K within one hour on the VIP day. It was incredibly positive, showing, got tons of emails, tons of feedback. End up taking the entire 22 piece collection to the lighthouse in Puerto Rico, where sales have topped over 100K. Um, and then I ended up showing it a few weeks ago in Paris at the brand studio during blockchain, uh, uh, Paris Blockchain Week, where I ended up meeting Lou and making some great connections. I wanted to show some of the pieces that have sold and the consequent NFTs that are with them um, and to basically give an idea of how I see the future of NFTs bringing more people not only onto the blockchain with physical art pieces, but being able to, as I said, bridge past, present, and future. Um, here are the one I sold to. So some pretty big collectors, by the way. So Brock and Crystal Pierce bought the first one. Jason Stone, 0XB1, biggest NFT collector in the world, uh, who might be joining us. Uh, Peggy Cohen. I also got Melton Tamiris to get the Mark Chagall one. So it's these pretty big name people in the world. I'm coming at it from a very physical art space. Uh, here's the Dolly one, which is a pretty exciting one. So, you know, I animate the signature. I'm, you know, he comes face to face with himself in that top right corner. I taught myself all the skills, everything you see from the physicals to the digitals. I touched every single part of it. I didn't hire out anyone else to do it. I really looked at it as an educational experience to learn from the best, uh, but also to understand and kind of push my own skill set here. So, 22 piece collection. Here are some of the other artists that are in the collection. Um, with every piece sold, the buyer gets to choose a school anywhere in the world, and I will paint a mural for them. This was actually the first one that was painted in Puerto Rico that got some really great traction. Um, so as I was saying, like I paint uh, a paint by numbers background. I show the kids how to use spray paint. We paint it together. They give me their words, and then we just kind of like make this incredibly uplifting uh, piece together. It actually made the front page of the newspaper there. NFT Now has written up, uh, us up a few different times, which has been exciting. Uh, and also there's an art documentary being filmed about it because after Christie's called it a new art category and said they'd never seen anything like it, it kind of prompted me to think like, hey, I'm onto something, even though uh, it's been a, a, a tough and, and uh, windy road. I definitely wanted to capture the entire process from you know acquiring the books to creating them, to marketing them, to selling them. And then just for full circle, uh, what ended up bringing me to uh, Paris Blockchain Week outside of one of my collectors, you know, bringing me out there, I created a piece with over 3,000, it's a book that I found that had over 3,000 paintings that were featured in the Louvre. And so what I do is I, I go in there, I dissect it, I try to understand what it is, and then try to create a work that really shows the essence of what we all know and love about the Louvre. And kind of bridging the gap to the future, I see this as something that can really go beyond just really high-end artists. Uh, and, and even just artists who passed away. But for example, here's a book that I acquired signed by Michael Jordan, and it shows the whole history. You know, with this, it's really beautiful chronologically from North Carolina to the triangle offense to, you know, the Olympics to number 45 to his last game as a bull. And so there's a really huge essence of storytelling that I find is at, at the heart of what I'm trying to do here. Here's some of the press that I've gotten. And here it's a quick thank you. So uh, I'm very excited to hear what people think, what they uh, are aware of with this, but uh, I wanted to give kind of a brief description uh, and hopefully hear from you guys. This is amazing. I love it. Um, so I'm going to ask the first question. People need to raise their hand, please. Let's ask some questions from Marco. Um, <clears throat> I, how different, I mean, obviously it's really different, but you're going from painting murals with spray paint to making digital art and putting it on the blockchain. Um, like, what are the parallels? What are the similarities? Is it still is art is art? Um, that, you know, can you kind of expand on that? Great question. So I believe that I found kind of a geometric motif that will always carry through whatever creative output I have. Um, it uses words and symbols that kind of bring us kind of bring everyone together but to me as a creative I feel being able to push the boundary in any way is not only healthy but really encouraged to be able to explore new ways and new th ways of thinking so for me you know when my live painting died down during COVID and I didn't know anything about digital designs I basically pushed myself through YouTube to learn everything about Photoshop Illustrator After Effects and try to really teach myself like I have these ideas I want to you know create them I don't want to give my ideas to other people to create I want to like push my boundaries. And in, in doing that, I feel like I open my creative, uh, you know, kind of like uh, 
Swiss army knife to be able to express myself in different ways. So there is a parallel. I like thinking that if someone were to see one, they might understand that, you know, that's a Marco Santini mural, just like that's a Marco Santini NFT. Um, but they are, like you said, very, very different mediums. And I'm very open and excited about that. Amazing. Uh, Johnny. Sorry, I just took a sip of water. Um, this is really cool. Uh, my question is a little bit from in from left field. So I'm really interested in like normie relations. And so I'm wondering when you're at a party, when you're meeting new people, and you start talking about um, what you're what you're currently working on, how do you phrase it so that you can get newer people to like be receptive to this this new way of doing art? That's a great question because I feel like being salesy and over the top is, is too much in any field. Um, you know, I came at it from a real world perspective. Like my fan base is on Instagram. I barely have a Twitter. I, I, I've been very, very new to like the digital Web3 uh, social media world. But uh, specifically to answer your question, I feel like I always have images of my work on me. It's not something that I'm constantly throwing at, at people, but I feel like it definitely comes up and it's something very interesting to explain the process of what I'm doing, but then it's another thing to really see it. So I feel that it's just kind of like a healthy way of bringing it up that's open. I'm willing to kind of share it with people and, you know, it depends on uh, on the person really. Any tips for us? Uh, any tips? I mean, having everything really organized in your phone is a huge tip. So like I have, I have like my best murals in one folder. I have my NFTs in one folder. Um, just so it's like easier to navigate. Like I, I don't even have that for my son. I feel like I should have a best photos of my son because people always ask me for that. <laughs> uh, but like, I mean, even when I when I met Max, like in person, like it wasn't, I didn't even show him my pieces. It was like, you know, it was just, we, we bonded and, and had a good time. And so I guess, um, yeah, it's kind of like what you're comfortable with. It's really truly a part of who I am. I mean, I'm more, I'm more so showing kind of photos of me painting the murals at the schools first, because I feel like that that's true to myself even before the NFTs and like really what I love doing, because I feel when I go into the schools and I speak to the kids and I show them, you know, that creativity can be taken in so many different ways. And I even talk to them a little bit about Web3 and just the importance of learning digital art. It kind of opens their minds in different ways. And that to me really um, can make a difference. And so the school murals are some of the most uh, excited ones that I've, uh, you know, ready to share. Super cool. Uh, Ivan. Hey, Marco, thanks for your presentation. Awesome stuff. Uh, really cool. Uh, looks amazing. Very unique uh, and different. And I'm curious, since uh, you've kind of uh, established a new style of art, have you seen any artists that are exploring the idea that you brought up to where they start cutting up out of books whether it's books signed by artists where it's an artistic book or any other book that's full of some sort of uh, picture or art or something that you can get creative with or even not like maybe you know i can see this uh my mind's going a million, a million directions you can start cutting out words and sentences and create new pieces of of sort of text based on what's already written in a book and at the same time it gives another user utility for books besides just sitting on on our shelves and so i was curious if you've seen some of that and then uh well, i don't know if i can ask us a, a sort of a follow-up to that but i will real quick before lou jumps on me is a uh, uh have you thought about the next level of taking then each page and making each page digital? So then what you have in as a physical piece, then turning that completely digital outside of just an individual uh, uh, standalone NFT? Yeah, so I'll answer your second question first. By the way, you, you really hit part of my internal psyche during this whole process. Um, one, I think there's an idea to kind of animate the design further to in, in having each piece. I wouldn't separate each piece as its own NFT only because I feel like there is a beauty to having it connected to the signature and the signature kind of encompasses the entire book. So if it was just one page with it, it wouldn't necessarily be that. So I like the idea of potentially animating and showing each of the cut lines and making it really kind of more higher end for, for a next series. But for your first question, I think when I was creating this, I was really nervous because I was worried that other people would be doing this. And the more and more people I talked to, the more excited I got by that. To me, to be a pioneer, to start this is one thing, but if other people catch on and start doing it, it really starts to prove a popularity point. You know, not as many people know, uh, you know, Picasso wasn't necessarily just the founder of Cubism. There were, you know, um, other people who came in um, and really started to, to 
you know, be other people, but because he was the face of it, he was the, the brashest and the loudest, he's kind of attributed to that. It doesn't really take off as a field unless other people kind of see it and, and internalize and make it their own. So I'd say at the beginning as kind of a more, you know, um, I don't know if immature is the right word, but kind of like limited mindset in the beginning of the, the process, I would have said, oh, I'm really worried that other people will do this. But now kind of my abundance mindset is saying, I'm excited for people to, to explore their creativity and try new things with this. And I'm really bringing it. Like I said, I'm calling it Illuminism. Uh, I call these illuminated books. Uh, the idea of like shining a light on an artist or on an author and really bringing to life what's inside. Because as I keep saying, you know, these books are not being appreciated. They're so valuable and so important. I think there's a really important aspect of, of reading through and reading through them and getting the knowledge out. And to me, I'm, a, I'm very much a visual learner. And to see a lot of these stories, you know, one of my earlier career, I did one of like Da Vinci and Michelangelo, and I could just picture those images. And I know like a bunch of their works all together. And to me, it's a learning process of like, okay, the, they did all these arts. And now I, I know what they did because I could see it together. So um I'm excited for the possibilities. I think it's really cool to be a pioneer. And I, I think it's really cool to be, you know, uh, among uh, other pioneers who will take this in different directions. So I'm excited to see what happens with it. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Uh, Kyle. Hey, Marco. So I jumped in the middle. Um, so I missed part of the presentation, but the second half seemed really interesting. It's something that you 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 said that kind of sparked my brain was how you're doing this kind of generational uh, connection between art pieces, um, between older artists and newer artists. Um, so I'm just kind of curious how you what your thought process is when you're when you're trying to convey an older artist's message, like what what goes into your mind and how you think about um, putting somebody else's voice or somebody else's narrative into a new piece. Um, like what do you think of as an artist? That's great, Kyle. I think there's two questions in there. The first is really me trying to be an objective observer to showcase the work appropriately. So like I said, um, I'm not sure how much of you caught, but I try to read through the book cover to cover, understand who the artist was, and then try to bring out the most important, powerful aspects of that book and, and turn it into a visualization. I think that that's really helpful because you know, I'm not trying to like, you know, cross out their eyes or trying to kind of degrade them or make them, you know, even though people have said, I can't believe you're cutting up this crazy valuable book. Like, how could you do that? And to me, it's like, how could you put this crazy valuable book on a shelf and look at it once a year and not get to, you know, excited by it. So, um, but then to your other point, I think, you know, I, I very much value blockchain technology and the idea of being transparent. I think that that's a really beautiful thing that is often uh, maybe uh, not uh, put to the top of people's priority list in terms of what we believe in maybe as a collective. And so specifically with this collection, I like the idea that in joining past, present, future, it's not just past artists being, you know, uh, collaborating with them in the present and then trying to make digital objects. It's really also for collectors who, you know, collectibles is this really beautiful word that's it's used in many different ways. And for Web3, collectibles can be, you know, PFP projects and like, you know, bright, beautiful, colorful images. But in the real world, collectibles really started as, you know, with sports trading cards or signed memorabilia or signed items. And really, I wanted to take physical collectibles that have an audience, I believe, in the real world, and maybe even call them more conservative buyers who are used to buying that at a gallery at an auction and trying to take them on the blockchain by saying, hey, this was, it's something that is very valuable. It's something that is authentic. It's something that's signed that has a value to itself, right? It's not like it's as speculative per se as some other uh, projects. You know, it's a signed Picasso, you know, it's a signed basket, like you're starting with that. And so I look at it as kind of like a you know, a, a safer, more valuable way to bring people who are more hesitant to come into the blockchain community into it. You know, like I've said, I've set up a few uh, wallet accounts and help people like get, you know, crypto and kind of understand that, bring them on, get them as collectors. And then when they have the physical and the digital, I, I feel like they can have more appreciation in different ways. So I really think as wallets become easier to uh, adopt and as people see wallets as kind of almost like a Venmo of sorts or you know, um, just a PayPal, like super easy, super reliable. I feel like there's more ways to kind of bring people into this conversation. If I could just throw one more thought out there. Yeah. Um, something I think that's really interesting that you're you're potentially doing too is you're you're rupturing that kind of linear expectation that people have when they're reading a book. Like a book is very linear. Um, and one of the things like the, the 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 writer David Foster Wallace, who's famous for having footnotes throughout his writing, this one of the rationales behind having all those footnotes is he said that 
it ruptured the person's linear perception of the book because they would have to go back and forth between the end and the beginning um, rather than just reading it like that. But I think you're doing it kind of in a different style where you're taking different parts of books um, and collating them into this like mirage or this collage of, of like literary expression um, yeah, but visually. Yeah, because I mean, if you see, if you look at these up close, I mean, when you see all these images together, you'd have to go to, you know, museums or galleries all around the world to see all of them in one place. And so with this, you can see, uh, you know, almost like a highlight reel uh, of an artist as seen through a book that they actually touched and physically were in the presence of. So I kind of, I kind of like that, as I said, like the storytelling approach, bringing together, you know, a, a real uh, story. And like, I mean, the George O'Keefe one is not in here, but it, uh, many of these books are chronological, so you can also see the evolution at, of an artist from the beginning to the middle to the end. I mean, you really see it with the uh, with the with the Jordan one, for lack of better uh, 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 explanation. But you really can see kind of a full career as done through the books, and so I think there's a lot of value in that. Definitely, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Quentin. Oh, you're still on no, mute still. Can you hear me now? Yep. Thanks. Um, no, just great work. The intricate detailing is is pretty amazing. And the, there's it's operating on a number of axes. And, and I like how there's also the, the subversive um, element to kind of destroying, you know, the old to bring life into the new. And then on the multi-generational side, how, um, you know, you're taking master works and then eventually it becomes uh, a mural uh, where you you are also teaching children art is is pretty amazing. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, as you sort of delved into, I looked at the collection on OpenSea, uh, which is which is really, um, you know, it, they're they're actually very nice on screen as well. Um, and I'm wondering uh, if you considered, given the amount of detail that's in that, um, doing anything involving either, you know. Solidity programming on chain or or AI, do you see sort of a kind of future with that specifically with respect to um, how all the different uh, visual traits interplay with each other? Oh, it's a very intricate question. My, I have thought about it. I think there's something really special, and I've always thought about this as an artist, where I'm physically touching every single piece from start to finish. You know, if, if you guys have ever seen, I think it's called The Value of Everything on HBO, where Jeff Koons, most, uh, you know, uh, billionaire artist living today, is asked, like, do you ever touch your pieces? He's like, I, you know, I physically, I, I have the idea, I tell other people what to do, and then they touch it, so there are my hands. But he physically never, I mean, he's up to the point where he's so in demand that if he only made paintings himself, he would only sell for way, way less, and it would be, you know, he'd make way fewer pa paintings each year and they'd be way more valuable. And so to him, having these minions create his work, uh, you know, allows him to kind of meet the demand and make so many more pieces. I, I think that that's a, obviously a very high level to get to and to be in that world renowned class is pretty exciting. But to me, I still feel in this moment and, and hopefully for a while that it's really important for me to physically have a touch of everything. And so actually I experimented with AI art in 2019 where I was actually the artist in residence for this company called, I don't know if it's still around, Icon, A-I-C-A-N. And they basically would take hundreds of photos of my artwork, smash them together, and then you would take one kind of hero image, and it would almost make like a photo filter, but out of all the hundreds of other images of your artwork. And I remember thinking at that time, like, I really love pieces that came out, but I was saying it wasn't my artwork. I know this might be con controversial because there's a, a broad uh, variety of, of uh, creativity and, and meanings behind it. I believe that creativity is turning your thoughts into actions. And we, we all do that in very different ways every day. But for me, when it came out of the computer, it wasn't my art until I physically touched it in some way. So what I did for my first solo show, which was called Unity and Diversity in the City uh, back in 2019, I took these AI images, I then printed them out, and then I painted on top of them. I added my own design, my geometric motif, my, my way to call it a truly my artwork. So for this, I think this is really intricate in the sense that each piece has to fit together in its own way. And there's something really beautiful about having the piece that was physically touched, at least the physical artwork, physically touched by the, the artist, the, the author, the athlete. I think with the digital design, I've been going in a few different directions. One direction could be like make the NFT as simple as possible because it's really just a certificate of authenticity that stands for the ownership versus make, you know, the other end of the spectrum is like 
make it as crazy and fun and colorful and almost imagining what that person would be creating if they were alive today. And for my signature series collection, all those artists had passed away and I wanted the neon color spectrum to kind of not only unite all the pieces, but to show if they were alive during a time when neon colors were around, they probably would have explored that rather than the more basic uh, color palettes that they had. And so to me, it was like, you know, exciting to, to link them all together. So I think to fully answer your question, I'm open to AI. I think I'd have to have a really stern approach to exactly how pieces fit together um, to really showcase that storytelling component where it wasn't like, you know, some people have called these like a visual remix, the way that we, you know, we were accustomed to in, in music where you're taking a book, you're remixing it. It's going through kind of, you know, the Marco Santini layer and then the output is this, this signed book here. Um, so very open to it, but um, open with with uh, healthy concerns, I'll say. Thanks, Quentin. Thank you, guys. Uh, Lou, go turn. Sure. So uh, that was great. Uh, great talk. You know, thanks a lot, Marco. You know, and the art is so creative. It's it's awesome to see a pioneer pushing the boundaries like that. And I also really appreciate the abundance mindset. I don't know if you've you ever heard of or read a book called uh, Sacred Economics. I haven't, but I've, I've, I've learned of the abundance mindset through many different YouTube videos and such. I'm going to write that down. Though. Yeah, yeah, it's really a lot about, you know, community is about when everyone, you know, that, that I define community as an ecosystem where when it works, everyone gets more out of it than they give. And that really is what can create abundance. Um, and, you know, and, and I, obviously I get that the art in of itself is, is massively valuable and, uh, but have you thought about, you know, adding additional utility onto the art? Yeah. So I, th I think, you know, when I originally had this idea and brought it to Maker's Place, it was kind of tricky, right? Because most PFP and NFT projects start with a very, very low floor price and have, you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of images. And the idea, which I very much understand, is bringing in the community and having people who can kind of rise up with you. And I, I love your definition of that, Lou. That stuck with me since you told me that. <laughs> um, with this series, you know, I had to invest a lot of money in the individual books to start with. And then I'm creating artwork that's on par and I think better than stuff I've created in the past. And so my price point, you know, I almost flipped it on its head where it's it's 22 pieces and each piece is really starting at 20,000 and up is it's a trickier sell. It's more like a fine art, you know, gallery sale than your typical, um, you know, starting out at least NFT project, unless you're talking about some of the bigger uh, programs. And so um, to me, the community component that the real, uh, the ability not only to access me, but to really pick a school mural. I mean, there are people who've been more excited by the mural sometimes in the book because they realize like, not only am I going to get this beautiful piece to hang in my home, my office, my my space, but then I get to choose a mural to be painted at a school to really give back. And so I think that that's a really um, great communal give back. I, I think that um, even though it wasn't necessarily um, with the collectors, the other thing I'll say in terms of my collection is I've, I've sold five of the 22. And with them, I know all of them individually, like you uh -huh. know, seeing them all in person, which is also tricky. A lot of the NFT stuff is kind of done, you know, on 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 chain, and and you don't really know who's buying or who's doing what. And so for me, it's been individual relationships that have had to go. Sure, in. but they've so, also been right. The people you highlighted, you know, they're an impressive group of people, like you know, Brock Pierce or Meltem. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think you know, you know, the one thing that I've been people in in crypto. So, you know, my guess is, is that aspect of it is obviously, you know, a, a, a major element. So it is. And for me, it's tricky because I, I'm, I'm definitely more than uh, dipping my toe in the water of Web3. I'm definitely, like, you know, trying to jump in and, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to meet you guys in person and going to more <laughs> events and, and doing more networking digitally and, and physically. But coming from the, you know, street art, physical world, my, my collector base is more, lower price stuff, prints, you know, <laughs> um, you know, physical pieces. And so this is kind of a, a new world that was a little bit scary to jump into, but I'm just, I believe in it. And I believe that this is going to hopefully bring some really high-end artwork onto blockchain and at least physical uh, artwork that can then, you know, really just open the, uh, the floodgates for, for the rest of us. It's great. Uh, and uh, it's, I'll, I'll ask another one since there aren't any more uh, any more questions? And that's uh, for your uh, thoughts and comments on Paris Blockchain Week. Wow, Paris Blockchain Week was 
just, it was kind of like an assault on the senses. Uh, and it, <laughs> everything was like next level. I mean, you know, physically like <laughs> being in Paris and the, the burning trash on the street aside, like just really meeting some, some heroes of mine and talking to some people in the industry. I thought it was great networking. I thought that not just at the conference, but at the satellite events, uh, I was really lucky to be kind of welcomed into a lot of places and, and Jason, one of my big collectors, brought me to a bunch of events with him and really connected me to a lot of people, which I was grateful for. Um, I'm just kind of, you know, a, a lifelong learner here and trying to understand uh, this new place and, and where I fit in it. So I've, I've been kind of just open heart and, and grateful mindset. Okay, well, terrific. Thanks a lot for, for sharing it with us, Marco. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. I, I, hope, I hope I can do it justice. It's a very in-depth one. Uh, could you describe your transition from creating individual art pieces to becoming a platform for artistic communication and distribution? Specifically, how did you navigate the need for sensory functions in order to achieve higher order legitimacy and validation in your work? Wow, there's a lot in there. Um, <laughs> well, I think... I think what's interesting in terms of validation, I'll handle that first. I think in the gallery world, you know, where they take 50% of your work often and prices can be hidden and nobody really knows who bought what for how much. Um, there's a lot more negotiation that can happen. Um, I feel like with blockchain, everything is so visible, right? You know who bought it, you know uh, how much it went for. And so I don't, necessarily need external validation for my work, but seeing the prices of my work before the signature series start to go up, go up and, up. and then seeing these pieces, uh, you know, validated, I guess, in some way at certain prices has been exciting to me. To, to me, it was tricky because the, there has been an overwhelming vocal support in terms of people reacting positively to this, but then the tricky part of like making the final, you know, sale and going through with it, like the, the excitement level and the sales uh, I would say almost have been uh, not inversely re re uh, related, but there's been way more excitement around it. And I'm wondering if there was either lower price point pieces or fractionalization or other ways to bring people in. It, it could have uh, worked out. I, I think that, I mean, that question was so in-depth and, and beautiful. It almost sounded like it was a run through chat GBT, whoever wrote that. That was a pretty good question. Um, I think I think it's important to have an essence of me in all of my artwork, whether it's physical or digital, and to have my own stamp of approval, but to not be bound by that. I think that we all maybe know artists who have become so well known for one specific thing, and they take that to the grave, and that's all they do, and they become known for that. I think that that's really special, but it can also be really limiting, and I think you have to make all crazy choices as an artist, and you have to make great work, and you have to make bad work that nobody ever sees, and you have to kind of make all the work in between to kind of keep evolving and pushing yourself, and you know, before this, there was a time where I was working with uh, some uh, athletes and celebrity clients who've been featured in magazines and books. And it really started as this visual uh, way of kind of, you know, rather than if you, if you got your first piece of press or if you got a major press story, rather than just frame your press article on the, the cover, I would make artwork out of that magazine and you would see your article and everything that happened in context with everything that was happening in the magazine that day. And, and it really kind of took off as this way of kind of visual storytelling to, you know, not only promote yourself, but also to promote everything that was happening. And so, I don't know, I just feel like it's important to always be learning and to challenging yourself and to step into new uh, realms. And for me, it's been, uh, you know, nervously excited <laughs> this entire time. That's awesome. Uh, Josh. <clears throat> Josh, I think you're on mute if you're there. Still on mute, Josh. Maybe he stepped away. We'll go, we'll go to Craig. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Craig Palmer. I'm the CEO of Maker's Place. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. By the way, hi, Marco. We, we going, Craig? Maker's Place really loved working with Marco. Um, you know, to create long-term value in art, you've got to create, I think, a bond between what you create and the people who buy it. And, you know, we brought him to Art Week Miami. You saw some of the, the shots from the exhibit there. And Marco is the kind of artist who's in the booth every single day, just loving and wanting to talk to people and create bonds and relationships. And that's so important. And, and we were very impressed with the way that he engages in a level of, you know, beyond a lot of artists in this space. Um, so that, that's fantastic. And I wanted to thank him for that. 
the other comment I, I wanted to make is that this really, you know, this kind of, of artwork caused us to really rethink some things as a marketplace. You know, so much of NFTs today are drops, 24 hours to buy, et cetera. And, you know, quick up and quick down sales. And, and that doesn't work with something like this. It, it, it's, it's complex art. There's stories to be told. People need to see it for a while. You've got to build relationships. And, and the 24-hour paradigm really doesn't work for things in this space. So we as a marketplace are, are really thinking about how, what's the best way for us to engage with artists like Marco when, when you know, works of this sort are brought to the table because we don't want to have a view that it that everything has to sell in 24 hours or we're done and it's not successful. Um, and so it's kind of causing us to think about how we right size the right program and approach it the right way for art of this sort. Um, uh, and then the last comment I'll make is that that this is there's obviously physical items here. We're seeing a lot of artists now wanting to pair digital and physical together. So on the back end of working with Marco, we actually launched, you know, uh, a, 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 a product or an extension to our product so that if there's a physical attachment to the NFT, we have a whole checkout process for that. You buy the NFT, that that unlocks the ability to to grab the item that comes with it and then puts you into kind of an e-commerce checkout process so that we can capture all the information about you because we have to know where to ship it. We have to know information more than might be available if you're just buying in crypto and all we have is your crypto address. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of things that we as a marketplace have had to think through and adopt to have the right product for this kind of offering and have the right process for bringing it to market and trying to make it successful over a long, longer period of time. But again, I, I just want to thank Marco because he's a pleasure to work with and I'm, we, we've always been so impressed with his art. Thank you, Craig. It's been amazing working with you guys and uh, I'm really excited about our relationship moving forward too. Yeah, uh, we love our relationship with uh, <clears throat> with Baker's Place. So I wasn't surprised when Marco told me that he chose uh, them to put his work out through. Um, they definitely do. There's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of people that I commend in the space uh, for doing a great job of moving the space forward, and Maker's Place definitely does a great job of it. Uh, Lou, uh, yeah, hey Greg, thanks a lot uh, for joining us. Um, and Mark, I was wondering, who do you get inspiration from? You know, in the in the NFT space. Oh man, I've, uh, definitely a lot. I mean, I think. I've been really inspired by a good friend of mine who started in the street art world and then also went digital. And we kind of been throwing ideas back and forth. He goes by, his name is Jason Naylor. He's a Brooklyn-based street artist uh, who actually just got a new job painting a mural together in Massachusetts in a few weeks. But he's he's done a really great job of bringing awareness to uh, different ideas. Um, I've been following um, Kay Dean and the Cosmo uh, de' Medici team. I think that they're really doing some special stuff. And I hope that you know, I really like their activation in Times Square, how it wasn't just PFP projects, but like really highlighting kind of the higher end version of it. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm still learning, but I, I'm inspired by a lot of different people. And to me, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're you're verified or if you have, you know, whatever your PFP is, like, I, I really just kind of value what people are saying and, and being brought into different channels. And so um, I find inspiration in a lot of different places in the Web3 community and specifically in the physical community. You know, like I was saying earlier, I mean, when COVID happened and I didn't have any live painting gigs, I, I literally wanted to learn from these iconic artists. And, and each, you know, each of them are still being talked about today for some reason way after their death. And so I was like, what made them so special? And, and I didn't mention this earlier, but there are really three interesting things that I deduced from reading all these bios. One was that many of these artists had crews or groups of people that they worked with, you know, sometimes ran ideas by or even stole ideas off of. Um, the second was that these artists really had a new way of seeing the world. They had a new medium, a new style, a new ism. And, and the third point in that new idea was that a lot of them were met with, uh, you know, harsh criticism or, or pushback when they brought these new art categories to the world. Uh, you know, Lichtenstein was laughed at like, oh, that's just comic book art. Same with Keith Haring, that doesn't belong in a museum. You know, a lot of these people, you know, these artists 
just kind of pushed through and believed in something so much that it didn't matter what other people thought, like they were going to keep doing that. And I felt that that really inspired me to continue going on as I was like creating this in my New York City, like tiny apartment during COVID and like, you know, just up all hours of the night, just like reading through and understanding. And I just found a, a great deal of inspiration in their stories. That's awesome. Uh, Julie, Thanks. I think you, uh, you have your hand up. I did, Marco. It's great to hear and see in real life, physical, digital, and you're bridging the gap and you're bringing it to us. I'm Julie Lamb. I'm the lead in events for the collective. And we really think outside the box. Wasn't there We're a picture excited. of you in his presentation? There was. Yes. Yeah, we met. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, we're going to be doing some pretty special things come in the fall and the winter next year. It would be really awesome to take a conversation with you offline, but bring it back into the fold. So when we can meet in real life, we can all group together and make that happen because supporting you in all factors is uh, something that we like to do and we like to help accelerate. So Greg, it's great to see you on the call and um, keep doing what you're doing because we're watching from the back end and the front end. There's nothing wrong with creating a black label, if you will something that's your super high-end line that's super fast output you make it happen you go along with certain trends but you know old world painting artistic fire in the belly never goes out of style so anything we can do to help you we are on board i love that thank you Jay. i really appreciate that i mean for me you know next steps are trying to find the right gallery or space to showcase the pieces because outside of the nfts that can be seen anywhere i really feel it's a special bond to see them like I was showing them earlier, you know, the physicals next to the digitals like we had at the lighthouse, even with Maker's Place, uh, you know, at Art Week, but being able to see like, you know, to that to the wall on the right, like that was my New York wall. Right? It was Keith Haring, you know, Andy Warhol's in the middle because he was kind of connecting Keith Haring and, and Basquiat. And you see the the physical piece that was, you know, touched by them that was created into the art. And then you see that, you know, they had whim screens, uh, digital canvases that were amazing. And like seeing the, the digital image on a screen next to the physical was really important to me. So any interesting gallery connections or interesting event spaces, definitely looking for kind of a, a more, uh, you know, more than just a, a single event pop-up, but would definitely like to showcase them either in the New York or area or beyond. Yeah, that we do have this really unique opportunity for a lot of different kinds of inventory. And as you're saying this between New York, Miami and Austin, um, we, we really do have some exquisite spaces. So we'll, we'll share that with you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Um, I think you should work with the Punk 6529 team and make some memes. I think <laughs> your work would really translate well to meme culture. So that's just my opinion. Um, but I'm also a big meme fanatic, so. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, Quentin is up. Hey, again. Yeah, just on that note, I mean, I'm uh, like, don't mean to tell you what to do by any means. Like uh, you've got a really great thing going on. You're very talented, obviously. But I'm wondering if um, you have explored metaverse galleries. There, there's a few, but um, it sounds like what one thing I have not seen in the space uh, done well, and and maybe it has been, and I just haven't been privy to it. But just sort of um, you know, kind of like a co-hosted IRL like uh, an actual physical gallery space with a metaverse space, and kind of creating the membrane. For those two together um just just riffing um like something that i've looked for but haven't seen i thought was would be really cool and, and kind of meaningful so yeah that's, that's, that's a great that point you're bringing me back to uh a contact i met in puerto rico who i worked with at a prior life at a different company and he has an online gallery in the metaverse it was like oh yeah whenever you want to put your stuff there and i just i never gave it much thought because I feel like it's cool to put it somewhere, but it's it, it doesn't really matter unless it has the eyeballs and the traction on it. So I, I feel like in finding a partner to host the, the NFTs online, it has to be something where there was at least some attention or some eyeballs being drawn to it. And maybe this person isn't the right contact, but definitely open to finding the right one because I, I think the animated NFTs are pretty awesome. And even being able to potentially put you know the physical images of the pieces uh, next to the NFT images could really kind of give some contact to them. So Thanks for re-racking my brain around that. Uh, have you heard of OnCyber? I'm assuming. OnCyber, no. Yeah, they just did a massive update and they've been kind of leading the way lately in terms of just rendering um, uh, artwork and uh, architecture, just a lot of features, more resolution, 
but also uh, there's a great community around it and punk 6529 is tied to that through his open metaverse but that might uh be a good place for you to look if you're ever curious so i just want to throw that out i wrote it down thank you so much yeah i second the on cyber uh plug as well um they've done a great job and not really anybody else um i would say <laughs> If you want eyeballs on your work, going into a metaverse that has a thousand users doesn't make any sense. Um, I don't know. Did anybody see uh, Jeopardy last night? The the final Jeopardy question was, you know, what word was coined, you know, in the nineteen ninety two book Snow Crashers, and nobody got it. Nice metaverse. I think we're early. <laughs> I don't think Jeopardy and crypto overlap. <laughs> That's my take. Um, awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much, Marco. This was great. Um, thanks for coming and uh, talking about your work and giving us a little, <clears throat> a little bit of an insight into your creative process. Um, I definitely want to have more artists come on and uh, you know talk about their perspective and their transition to, di to digital from physical. I think it's a really important topic um, and one the collective should um, kind of concentrate on. Uh, I think you're probably the first artist that we've had come on. So thank you for being your guinea pig. Hey, what uh, about Logic? Oh, that's right. We had Logic. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Logic ever did physical work, did he? Um, I'm not sure. But yeah, we had Logic come on. I'm sorry. What was your question? Did Logic do physical pieces or has he always been di just digital? Uh, good question. I'm, 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 I, I don't know, but... Uh, he did a, a Chicago Bull thing too, right? Yeah, for uh, for Coinbase. Can yeah. we get a copy of the presentation? Yeah, I'd be happy to send it out. Uh, I, I, what I was going to do is I'll probably send out a link to the Maker's Place link on the maybe the, the Telegram group, and then if if you want to send me your individual email, I can send you the WeTransfer transfer uh, with the presentation. That's a that's a great uh, segue to our speaker on Monday, uh, who's going to be Mike Kasdan, who is an intellectual property lawyer, uh, one of the foremost in the NFT space. So, Marco, don't give up your IP that easy. Um, yeah, so that's going to be a great chat on Monday. I know we were going to have uh, we were going to have kind of a roundtable on collective topics, but I think we can postpone that. For Mike, and I think it's really uh, topical to have an artist and then an IP lawyer come who's protecting artists' rights in the digital space. Um, so that's going to be on Monday. Uh, join us then. Thanks so much again, Marco, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>